It is Friday, April 5th, 2024. This is another edition of Football Today where the three knuckleheads are reunited. You know those two dudes from the Talking Giants world. It's Pennick, it's Skinner, it's Rose checking in as well. And guys, sorry I missed all the fun. I was, you're right, Bobby. I heard you. I was being a, a terrible dad and taking my kid around to college. My wife heard <laughs> no, that. No, no, like, no. You were being a good dad and a terrible empl- employee member. Work becomes yes. Work comes before family. You're right. You're right. Any su- that's the beginning of any any success book is deny your family to to further your career. And it could be even worse if he decides not to go to that college that we visited. Could you imagine? What college that, was right? it? Uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Say that three times. Yeah, I'm I'm actively rooting against them because you weren't able to be on the Stefan Diggs episode. <laughs> I hate the Mustangs now. Screw those guys. Actually, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I'd never been to that part of California. It's wonderful. It's an outstanding university. Got a chance to meet some of the baseball people, which was really cool. Um, and we drove by the football stadium. Aren't the it's athletics going to play there next year? You are a funny man. <laughs> Stop mixing your sports here at John Boy Media. You Look at you. You are so proud of yourself right now. It's incredible. The snicker on your face is amazing. Yeah, that, was, that, 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 that one got myself pretty good. I don't Can we get back often, to the but... Stephon Diggs trade, though? Yeah, let's, let's there talk about is a Stephon little bit Diggs. of news yeah. that happened the day after the trade. It was announced on Thursday that he's going to be a free agent after this year, that the rest of the years are, are bye-bye. So if he has a great year, he's going to play basically for $22 million bucks. So essentially, the Houston Texans traded a future second rounder for one year of guaranteed Stephon Diggs does it change the way you see the trade between the Bills and the Texans now, Bobby? Well, absolutely. For the Bills, it doesn't change anything. For the Texans, so because they did this, they can't get a comp pick if he left and got some type of big contract, right? So there's, you can't put that in there. At any time a team makes a bad move, the fans will defend it. Well, what, what, we could get a comp pick. Can't do that. I, I just don't understand why the Texans did this because there was no dead money on the contract anyway. So they could have cut him at any point anyways. And from Stefan Diggs' point of view, like this contract that he had was pretty good. And I with the target share he's going to get, like I don't know if he's going to be able to cash in for an, another big deal besides maybe a one- or two-year deal. But I, I don't really understand this at all besides Stefan Diggs not wanting to play for the Texans long term. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I actually I want to compare some of the wide receiver contracts before we go out on a limb and say that this is maybe bad for Stefan Diggs. But Stefan Diggs was still like, let's just say it goes well this year, right, Rose? It goes well this year. Stefan Diggs has a good year with Houston. Now, maybe it's not the 160 target year that he's always used to in Buffalo, but it still makes sense. I think the cap hit next year would have been 18 or 19 million. That's what the cap hit would have been next year with no with zero dead money if the Texans wanted to move on. Mm-hmm. But you have a good player there in Stefan Diggs, so why wouldn't you want to keep him even though you could move on and you could save that money, right? Why would you want to move on if he's good? So is that like is, is that a good number for St- could Stefan Diggs get twenty million if he hits the open market? I, I want to look at other wide receiver contracts, but really the Texans also moved up three and a half million dollars guaranteed. I think. Ne- this is according to the Schefter tweet. There, even though there was zero dead cap money for next year, there also was still somehow the Texans took the three and a half million dollar guaranteed to Diggs next season and moved it up to this season. So usually you'll have teams be like, "All right, we're going to push the money back so we can have more money now." This is the exact opposite. They're pushing money to the present, which isn't bad, but then also there's like, why wouldn't you give yourself the option to have this guy? on the books, on the contract, on your team for years for C.J. Stroud to continue to develop and have that connection, it just doesn't doesn't make sense for... It's it's basically like, Chris, I'm going to use a baseball term. It's like a one-year rental. It's what this is. That's exactly what it is. I mean, that's And if exactly he plays what really is. well and they want to bring him back, even if it's on a one-year deal, it would be like the same amount of money because, you know, with the cap going up and stuff. It just... I don't really understand this from the Texans' point of view at all, besides maybe trying to make Diggs happy. Like, I, I just don't get it at all. Like keep him motivated? Uh, is that part of it? I well, hope not. Not the mo- I don't know if it's the motivated part. I think he plays hard, okay? I think it's, is it to keep him in line? Because that is part of the Stefan Diggs discussion, right? This is now, it's been two places. It not a, he just kind of forced his way out of Buffalo with whatever he's tweeted, whatever he's retweeted, whatever he's said at times, sometimes his actions. 
This happened before in Minnesota. It happened, but he did not show up for work on like a Wednesday. Oh, they were playing the Giants that week. I remember I was was very much rooting for him to not show up that week, 2019. Right? So, like, and so they were like, okay, you know, we get it. He's a good player, but let's move on. They got a haul of draft picks, including the one that turned into Justin Jefferson. So I'm not saying that's what's going to happen with Buffalo's selection a couple years from now in the second round, that he's going to end up being the best wide receiver in the draft. But you guys covered it yesterday. I mean, is it possible, Penick, that part of this was to make sure he stays in line on top of everything else? I would have thought that how it was set up anyway, it would it would help him stay in line. I'm putting that in quotes for our audio people. I would, you know, how that would help him stay in line because he has the zero. It's the zero dead cap. So could have cut him at any time. That has to be that. No that would have that would have had to be communicated. That listen, yeah. like even though you, you know you're you're on the books for the next two three years, but they could let you go at any time. Now maybe you know, Chris. Here's the thing. So I, I hear I loaded up the average a- average annual value for wide receivers, and here's like receivers that are now similar age wise to Stefan Diggs at their points of their career, and all these guys are earning you know twenty to twenty and a half million dollars. They're all right in the line. Amari Cooper, Keenan Allen, Mike Evans. They're all earning $20 million. Mike Evans is earning $20.5 million. DJ Moore is $20.6. Bobby said the cap's expanding. Like, Stefan Diggs, I really think if he were to hit the open market next year, with the cap expanding, with all the salaries going up, he would get more than $20 million. And then what his original contract was, was like $18 or $19 million. That's what the cap hit was for 2025. He would get more than that, I think. Here's the thing, though. What chance, like, yes, the cap goes up, but Mike Evans just got, we just had the biggest cap explosion maybe ever. Mm-hmm. And Mike Evans got that contract, from, been the good soldier, been the 1,000 yeah. yards every year, hometown player. Like, the, him getting anything more than Mike Evans is, a, like, a bad bet. And he's not going to have, like, he'll have good numbers this year. He is their best wide receiver right now. I'm not really buying into the whole decline at the end of the season thing last year with him. I think it was more the more of a, an effect of Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator. Like he's not going to get. He might like so he's. This would be a bet to make two mil two million dollars a year. Sounds like a lot, but there's to me it's more likely that he's signing a one year seventeen million dollar contract than yeah. he is a two year forty four million dollar contract next off season. Let, let me get a little bit more to the kind of emotional side of Stephon Diggs because he has been an exceptional receiver. Uh, the last three or four years. I mean, he's put up unbelievable, unbelievable numbers, uh, particularly for a guy who's not a burner out there. Do you think people, when they when you hear the name Stephon Diggs, think more of him as a great receiver or as kind of a pain in the ass, Bobby? Great receiver because he's been a pain in the ass, but it's never... Impacted the field. It's. I don't think it's impacted the field, and I also don't think that he's someone that rubs off on the other guys. You know what I mean? Like I'm sure, like mm. there's friends and stuff, but you you've looked at it both in Minnesota and Buffalo, and the large majority of those teams have probably taken like the team and the rest of the locker room side than Stephon Diggs. Like the pain in the ass is when this just there's such a pain in the ass that it's unavoidable, and it's not just annoying stuff that like Diggs does or that pain in the ass gets guys in the locker room on their side against the head coach, against the quarterback type of stuff. Diggs was never able to do that in Buffalo, and he's not going to be able to do it in Houston either. Yeah. Nothing? You know, you're, you're not walking down that road? You just don't see it at all? Didn't I hear you guys, though, talking about... Well, no, that's why I think paid- Buffalo traded him, but what I'm saying, for it's such... like. This happens with every wide receiver who does this. Is He's going to go there this year, unless it's Antonio Brown. He's the exception. Year one, he's going to be on his best behavior for for the most part. Like That's what happens. Is like The disgruntled wide receiver gets, gets traded, goes to the new team, is you know, the, the, the perfect citizen for year one, and then, and then, this, then when it, uh, is when it starts to all crumble down a bit. Yeah, it's fair. It is fair. I thought you made a really, really good point that he doesn't seemingly affect the rest of the people here. Now, you know, maybe in 
10 years when guys are done playing and we'll hear exactly what it was all about behind closed doors, right? I mean, like his brother was tweeting in the middle of last season, free 14, free, which by the way, is the most overplayed thing. If you are a fan or a an athlete and you're trying to tweet something creative or put on social media, stop using free, for, really? We use that for people who were imprisoned, you know, against their will. Who were amazing humanitarians? Free Rasheed Please Rice. Stop doing it. Let's free. Stefan Diggs was just fine. He was catching a hundred passes up in Buffalo. He was playing with a pretty damn good quarterback. Can we just stop that team shit, that's competing please? for a Super Bowl every and, year, Chris? And that's I, why it doesn't have a negative effect on it. Like it, it does have a negative effect, is because I said it on the episode uh, yesterday. Is that it's tiresome, right? It's it's tiresome to have someone who is a great player, but you got to kind of dance around his. You got to walk on eggshells around him. Make sure you don't do anything that overly offend. Like it 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 gets tiresome. And after after all these years in Buffalo, they're like, all right, we're we're done. We're not we're not going to do this again. But usually, it's when it's really cancerous is when that team's quarterback is bad and that team's head coach doesn't have the belief of the locker yeah. room, and that guy gets people on his side. Yeah. That didn't happen in Buffalo, and it's definitely not going to happen with the Texans and C.J. Stroud and D'Amico Ryans. I do think something happened in Buffalo before this, though. Oh, because, there's been you know, it's been toxic. We like, we talked it, about the timing of it. Like this didn't happen in free agency. This didn't happen, you know, closer to the combine where you're maybe having these discussions. Right? This this happened now. You know, kind of like in this little bit of dead period of the NFL in terms of transactions. Um, I think something had to happen where. Bills reached a breaking point, and I, I think it's not Diggs reached a breaking point. I think the Bills reached a breaking point with Stefan Diggs around this time. Something had to happen, and I think that's why it was made. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Scr- Head scratching, transactional move by the Texans, though for sure. It's still like a good, great move for them. Like 2024 is going to be super fun, but you know, if this is you know you're still continuing to build for the future. I guess may- maybe they have questions and maybe they have hesitations around Stefan Diggs too. I-, I just don't think it's a great move for the Texans now though, because they just, they gain nothing from this. They could have cut him at any time. No, that's not true. They gain, they gain nothing after 2024 in 2024. They still get a very, very good football player. Who well, no, I'm saying they, they gain be- nothing from changing the contract. Oh, the changing the contract. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows why? that was exactly done that's a great question yeah there's got to be more like there's there it, there's got to be more details behind them Ho- maybe we'll hopefully find out in the next couple of days but it just doesn't make sense to change that contract right in the meantime you know there are people who are wondering exactly what was buffalo's thinking is it good enough to eat 31 million dollars against your cap to say goodbye to a guy who may have been a problem inside the four walls uh brandon bean the architect of that franchise um he has heard the calls from people wondering why they made the move. And he says, everybody, just slow your roll. We play in September. So uh, let's be patient and let us work through this. Was it easy? No. But you're always, if you make the best decision for the Bills going forward, that's, that's all you can do. You can trust that. And so this organization and... Our fan base needs to trust that we're going to trot out a damn good team come September. And that's our plan, and that's not changing. All right, so we understand that this is early April, Brandon, and you don't play football next week. Next week. We get that. But if you were to ask Buffalo fans right now, Panic, they are probably panicking a little bit. They said Because they didn't only see Stephon Diggs leave. You guys covered... Who else has left? I mean, it's going to be a revamped secondary, parts of their offensive line, the whole bit. And I I think you guys, it was interesting because I listened to the podcast on Wednesday. You guys are like, oh, there's still the team to beat, definitely in the AFC. I think everybody's got big time question marks in that division. You really think that they're, they're like at least a half lap ahead of the Dolphins and Jets? No, I mean, I, I think Bobby's a little bit higher on them than, than me like I think they're going to be fine and I I still definitely have questions like even you know I I I don't want to I know people like to downplay Gabe Davis he was still their wide receiver too like the role think of just the role right and Stefan Diggs yeah they they administered the ball they distributed the ball towards the second half of the year 
through the final four or five games of the season. They were the hottest offense in the NFL. NFL teams are still game planning for Stephon Diggs. And now they don't have that. They don't have that force. Like besides, you know, obviously Josh Allen, who are you game planning? Who are you preparing for on that Bills offense that's really going to scare you and fright you? Really nobody besides James Cook, the running back. So, you know, that that's where I'm at. You know, I'm like, I, I think my first thought it was, it kind of went to the Jets where it's like Jets fans have to be ecstatic. And, you know, I Bills fans, I think Bills fans are, more or less kind of upset that it just didn't work with Stefan Diggs because you have this. It did this work. It, it did you didn't work get a Super Bowl. You, you didn't get a Super Bowl out of it. Oh, come Where on. That, and at the end of the day, you can't. That, that's not how you measure success in this league. There's so maybe that was poorly phrased. Things. Chris, maybe that was poorly phrased because this Bills, like as a, as a Bills fan, this Bills franchise, the expectation with this window with Josh Allen, it is to win a Super Bowl, right? It is to win a Super Bowl. So I think Bills fans are upset that it didn't work with Stefan Diggs in terms of on that path to getting a Super Bowl. It Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen didn't happen. Because how rare is it that you have every single year? He's he's a he was a Bill for four years. Every single year he had 154 targets, almost 100 receptions, and not over 100 receptions. He was really, really good every year and he was available. He didn't get hurt. So I mean that that's rare. It's rare to see that. You know, in, in a day of age where everybody's getting hurt and, you know, everybody, you know, there is no, con- there's not a lot of continuity anymore. So I think it's just upset that it didn't work with getting a Super Bowl, but I still do think like Bills fans, similar to what we said last episode, I think they do trust that it, Josh Allen will continue to carry this offense and it will work. They'll administer the ball. They're going to be a little bit more run heavy, but. My brain also did go to like the Jets. Like Jets fans have to be ecstatic that Diggs is out of the division. Well, all right, so now how I think they're the number one team. Who's the I'm number one? To go the Jets. I I'm willing to go as far to say the Jets have moved in my AFC East power rankings to number one now. Well, here's the thing: we haven't had the NFL draft yet, right. like Brandon, right. like Brandon Bean said. I think they are still in a good. Offensive line is, is, you know, they did add Leo Collins. We'll see how healthy he can be. I think Dalton Kincaid, before this all happened, I thought was was going to be my year to, you know, jump guy. And, and he didn't even have a bad rookie year. He had, you know, 73 catches, almost 700 yards, which is pretty good for a rookie tight end. I think he's going to have a really good year too. Curtis Samuel, who's been a solid player in the NFL, his best year was with Joe Brady. James Cook is really good. When I heard that Brandon Bean clip, that made me think of a guy who's going to do his best to add a, a wide receiver in the first round and it reinforce that wide receiver room. So I, I think they're going to do their best to really still add something to that. Uh, I know that T. Higgins, like his future in Cincinnati, it's, I don't think his future is even in doubt. I think it's in stone that this is going to be his last year if he makes it there. I think they might be willing to get aggressive and try and bring him in, even though I don't know if Cincinnati would want to trade him to Buffalo specifically. So I I think they're really going to still work to make that wide receiver room better. And I don't, I look at their weapons and I don't, they don't scare you, but they're also not like depleted of talent. Totally. Would you be more interested if you were Brandon Bean in trying to trade for T Higgins and giving up a one and extending him and making him your new lead dog? out there Bobby because of where they pick yes yes I I I would want to do that because of where they pick um now if they if they feel they can trade up and you know get a they're not gonna they'd have to do an insane trade to trade up for you know one of the top three receivers I don't envision that but if they really like Brian Thomas or A.D. Mitchell then they can make a reasonable move up for those guys. I would prefer that, but it's just hard to guarantee that you can do that on draft day. But like, are, are we shocked if T. Higgins gets traded on the, the first round during the first round of the NFL draft? No, it would be. It, it happened with AJ Brown a couple of years ago. So, and it was the same exact scenario, right? Heading into the last year of his contract, former second round pick that had played big time. And the difference is, is that there was nobody on the other side of AJ Brown in Tennessee where you were like, yeah, we got to go take care of that guy. That that's the difference is that we all know that Jamar Chase is going to break the bank and it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So do you want to have T Higgins, an outstanding player playing for 21 million or whatever the franchise is this year, but not being happy about that. I know it sounds weird that you, 
not going to be happy making $21 million, but the guy wants, we understand it. He wants the longer guarantee, more guaranteed dollars. We understand that. I think, I think you Buffalo, and I don't care that they're in this, they're competing. Like, okay, so what? We have to see T. Higgins in January. Great. We'll take an, another first round pick, help this team get further along. We'll replace him with a younger wide receiver, cheaper model, and we'll beat you in the playoffs like we did it two years ago. I don't know. I think that'd be a fun move right there. Yeah, I, I, I don't get why the Bengals aren't motivated to keep T. Higgins. Like, obviously, they have to make decisions, but they could very well move Cap around and and just keep... I mean, they're playing him on the franchise tag this year. Like, they could they could reduce his cap hit this year and spread it around. I think they should, too. Um, but 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 I, it's not it's just not happening. Like every report out of Cincinnati is that this is this is his last year, even even if he pl- you know plays this year for Cincinnati. Well, you have to remember when you move guys' money around for cap, it means you have to spend more cash now. You actually have to pay them now. That's a big part of this whole deal. It's what Jimmy Haslam has been doing in Cleveland, right? It's part of the reason that they're able to keep as many of their good young players because they are willing to give that, that has not been the MO of the Brown family in recent years. Like, wait, the cash has got to come out of our pocket now. So I don't know if that's something they're willing to do. They're not a big restructure team at all. They certainly haven't been at this. point. We'll see, but you got, all right, Bobby, give me your top three in the AFC East. We'll put the Patriots at the bottom. I can fill out number four for you. Give me an order and how close it is between one, two, and three. I got Buffalo Bills one. Hmm. I, I'm going to say the Jets two. How, how many times can we reinvent the wheel for the Dolphins offense? They lost some good uh, young pieces like Christian Wilkins. And then I'll, I'll say the Dolphins three. And then pay, but the what's the gap? Three. What's the gap? I think the gap is now the Jets went beat the Bills whenever they play in the regular season, but we're talking about through a course of a season, I think the the Bills are much more solid than than the Jets. Where the Jets, it looks good on paper right now, but they've got a lot of injury prone players on that team, including including Q- QB one. Ah. Uh, and then, to me, the Dolphins and the Jets are, are somewhat of a toss-up. But I think that Jets defense is going to be really good again. And if Aaron Rodgers can stay healthy, they, they'll they win 10 games. All right, Impress- so... I th- I, the Go Jets ahead. and Dolphins yeah. are, like, on the same plane to me. Okay. I trust the Jets more in the playoffs, that's for sure, because they have Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. But for a regular, regular season, you know, standings, I can see the Dolphins being number two. I preface this every time I talk about the Jets, where like my brain, my brain is telling me that it's going to blow up. It's not going to work. Usually teams that build this way and go totally go all in and be so irresponsible. It doesn't work. Right. Especially when you have, you know, the, an, an a-hole at quarterback who I haven't liked. Um, but I put them number one because my heart, my heart is like, I like their off season. Like, you know, it, some, some riskier moves, some guys like Bobby said that are injury prone, but I feel like after being a little bit critical of them after, you know, then they went and they got Tyron Smith, they do Mike Williams, they have, they have picks, they get a son Reddick and it's like, all right, yeah, well, for a team that's supposed to be all in, you're being all in. And I have them number one. Um, it's number two, the bills and it's tight. I, I, I view those two teams as it, it's very tight. Um, and then there's a tier below. It's the Dolphins. I do think that defense is going to stay, take a step back. Vic Vangio uh, and we Wilkins are gone. And then, obviously, Patriots 4. God, is it good news or bad news for me that I'm agreeing with Pennick? I think you're a pretty good mind, Pennick. I really do. Half of the time, some of the time. I think I'm going to follow you. Yeah. I'm going to follow you down the, down the uh, trail to the Meadowlands. Because my like we will the fight bra- on, you know the brain the brain says that it's like you know it's not going to and you know we could easily be talking week two week three and this guy's hurt that guy's hurt this went wrong that went wrong but if you look uh, if you you don't win the games on paper but they're doing what they need to do and they're and they were still a good team last year despite 
at times they were a good team. They won football games with really bad quarterback play, and that's what they've done the last couple of years. Okay, speaking of bad quarterback play, uh-huh. we have spent a lot of time on this show talking about not the top three teams who obviously are quarterback needy, but it's the next triumvirate right in the middle of the first round, 11, 12, 13. We've talked extensively about the Minnesota Vikings and probably their desire to move up, maybe even into the top three to go get their next quarterback. We've talked, we talked earlier about Michael Penix, and it sounds like the flirtation that the Raiders have with him at 13. We haven't spent a ton of time on the team that's sandwiched in between Minnesota and Las Vegas, and that's the Denver Broncos. We know that they got rid of Russell Wilson, and we keep hearing, oh, we're great with Jared Stidham. We'll be good. Don't worry. We'll be fine. Does anybody have Paxton Lynch on speed dial while we're there? Like, what are they going to do? What are they going to do, Bobby? What sh- or what? How about this? What should they do? <sighs> they might have the most dire quarterback situation in the NFL. Like, you, yes. we've talked about the Raiders a good bit. But at least they have, like, hey, Aiden O'Connell, who did start for the majority last year, and Gardner Minshew, who started on a team that, you know, won nine games last year. So at least it's like, okay, with Jared Stidham, man, that's just, that's really, really bad spot to be in. Bo Nix would probably be a pretty good fit for Sean Payton, but I don't think you could take him at pick 12. Like, and do you see Sean Payton being patient, right? Where it's like, yeah, we're just, this is going to be a gap year where we basically, we punt on the year. We're not going to have a court, like. There's no good answer. I don't know why that they didn't try and bring in a, like a, f- a free agent. Why, why didn't they go and like try and bring in Tyrod Taylor or Jacoby Brissett or, or whatever and like spend money on one of those quarterbacks That's to kind of have themselves a plan, huh? That's the guy. They should have gotten Jacoby Brissett. Like Jacoby Brissett can win games and not embarrass the – if you're Even Jameis, like anybody but just Jared Stidham. Like, that's just a bad plan to have going into the draft. That's not a plan. It is not that nobody can convince me that that is a plan. That is not a plan. Heck, even Minnesota, which we all think is going to trade up and try and get somebody, at least Sam Darnold, it, it's not great, but it's not Jared Stidham. I'm sorry. Nobody can convince. You're trying to convince. No, he's horrible. Broncos fans. 100 Broncos fans out there to come to our game. Who's starting today? Jared Stidham. Well, I didn't say it left guard. I said a quarter. Yeah, it's Jared Stidham. Here you go. They have to trade up. They, I think they have to trade up to secure somebody. I've got, I'm being honest here. Because if Who? not, somebody might leapfrog those dudes. They would probably have to trade all the way up to four. Oh. Are they going to do another big trade? <laughs> it is comical that was demonic there panic what do you think <laughs> i i don't know like i i don't i don't know what they're planning you, you you want to know what i would do for this year and this is kind of a punt move and I, i'm i'm honestly i'm i'm on walter football right now looking at their top 30 visits i think their move is to take Penix if he's there and even what's probably more realistically is Spencer Rattler, Michael Pratt. They met with at the combine. You know, uh, Joe Milton has a big arm. I, I can't see Sean Payton really. I don't know about Joe Milton, but you know, you know what's really funny. I'm looking at the the thirty visits. Some call top thirty. Michael yeah, top he- 30 uh, Bobby, did you, did you do your eval on Michael Hears from uh, the quarterback from Samford? No, I haven't got to that yet. No, I haven't got to Remember Russ him? Callaway, Justin? He was the offensive coordinator at Sanford but with Devin Hodges as the quarterback. So uh, Michael Hears is the uh, on the media consensus board is uh, the 412th ranked uh, player um, in the nation, and the, the Broncos did have a, a top 30 visit with him. Uh, they also had a top 30 visit with Michael Penix Jr. They met with Michael Pratt at the Combine. That's where I, like, honestly, that's what I think their move is. I think their move is, is that they're going to take a quarterback that's you know, I, and usually you you won't hear me say this, and I, you, you definitely won't hear Bobby say this, but, you know, like, we, we haven't advocated for really any of these teams, like the Raiders or, you know, like some of the other teams that, we were, that we've been talking about. You know, we mentioned that we talked about Minnesota. Like, never, like, never am I going to advocate for taking a guy that you're not sold on that could be your franchise guy. But I think for the Broncos this year, 
Like I'm even looking at Spencer Rattler had a good senior bowl. And if mm-hmm. he's not a head case and if he's kind of in, that could be a fit and you just see what happens. And then you see where you are as a franchise. It, and Spencer Rattler did come out and say that he had his most extensive visit with Sean Payton in oh. Denver. He's like, well, I get it. Why he was so good at what he does. He's like, nice. that was, that was a kind of a brain rattling meeting with him. Let's just play it out and say that that's the direction they go. Whatever round it is, third, four, I don't know where Spencer Rattler is going to go. Second, maybe, uh, who knows? If that is indeed the case, will there ever have been a team going into training camp with a less decorated group of possible starters? I mean, I'm talking about guys, sometimes there are guys who kind of float around and they were a former first-round pick and while he's competing for a backup role or whatever. If that's the three of them, if it's our buddy Ben DiNucci and Spencer Rattler and Jared Stidham, Woo. It's like the Matt Flynn and Russell Wilson Seattle Seahawks. Except that Matt Flynn, people were excited about him. I can't believe he got a they contract. They were. He had who, one. Who was the starter who they the Raiders decided not to start week one over Derek Carr his rookie year? What year was that? 2014 was uh, Derek Carr's first year. You're trying to see what veteran it was. I remember, like, it was kind of a surprise that they started him. Um, week one. It, w- oh, it was, it was it Matt, Matt Schaub. Schaub then? It was Matt. Schaub. It was Matt Schaub. Wow. Okay. Interesting. I don't think we can spend too much time on it because we'll just want to bang our heads against the wall and try and figure out what the heck is going on. Yeah. Yeesh. All right. So Derek Henry has found a new home in Baltimore. <laughs> Really good fit. We all believe in that. But he said on the pivot that Dallas would have been his perfect landing spot, ideal landing spot, but that the Cowboys didn't reach out for the former Titan. If that is indeed true, is that a huge mistake, Justin? I mean, I say yes from like, damn, that would have been a really good fit or or behind that offensive line. But then also from a team building standpoint, no. Like, I think Dallas is going to be just fine in terms of manufacturing a running back and manufacturing a running game that's going to keep you on schedule and, you know, maybe get some explosives out of there. And, you know, I, I don't know at this stage of his career, is, is Derrick Henry going to give you a, a ton of explosives, even though, hey, he's still really good in the open field, stiff arm, yards after contact, all that stuff. So on paper, like, yeah, behind a really good offensive line, it makes sense. Jerry Jones is saying he's all in. But also from a team building standpoint, I... I don't mind it. We know that offense is built off throwing the ball, play action, Dak Prescott thrown at the CD Lamb, we and even utilizing the tight ends too. We know that's what it's built off of. So I, I don't mind them not doing it. It would have been fun though. It, it would have been very fun. You know, on at the surface level, I'm like, no, nope, it's fine. It's an aging running back. He had 1,100 yards last year and over 10 touchdowns on a Titans offense that was pathetic. He's still good, right? Horrible, like. Path- and the contract is is per- fairly cheap. It's two years, $16 million, and essentially uh, only one year of it is guaranteed. I, I I know that the Cowboys didn't have a ton of money to go out and do for agency. This felt like this would have been the perfect move to supplement the short term for them after they lost Tony Pollard. So, yeah, I, I do think the Cowboys should have done this when, in reality, I'm never going to be like, oh, but yeah, you need to go get the aging running back. I, I actually would have done this if I were De- uh, Dallas. Huge mistake, but this was their game plan. We had heard at the scouting combine that they were like, we're still figuring out the DAC stuff, but the rest of it is our players that are here are just going to have to play better, and we're not going to add a lot of pieces, so don't expect us to. And sure enough, they didn't lie to us. I mean, they told us the truth. You know, Which I don't mind that philosophy, but this would have been a like a really nice deal for them. Yeah, it just doesn't make much sense. Particularly, yeah, when you see what he ended up getting from the Ravens. And by the way, if you still wanted to go get another running back in the draft, there's going to be plenty of them in the middle rounds. And maybe you hit on one of those guys, and maybe one of those guys becomes a star eventually. But you know what? You can still get something out of Derrick Henry. Yeah, I mean, there were some runs. It was funny. I mean, he had a really, really long run in one game. And it was like 60 yards. And I remember watching it at, at the network and turning on one of my buddies, Alex Maloney, is one of our great producers there. And I said, man, like, 
four years ago, that's a touchdown, isn't it? Or three years ago? He's like, yeah, easily. I said, but still, the guy can run. He's productive. He doesn't miss a ton of time, and he's a good dude. And he's He looks like he's wearing a football uniform without putting shoulder pads on. I was <laughs> I mean, like, like that's fascinating. I think he's been the best argument against the whole paying running back things over the last, you know, five or five or so years. It has been Derrick Henry because he's been consistently good. Came back from the injury pretty good. Uh, he's, you know, made that Titans offense go. He made Ryan Tannehill look much better than what he is. Uh, set up some of that play action stuff to get Corey Davis paid, you know, and then obviously AJ Brown was a stud in his own right. Uh, I think he's, I got, I think Derrick Henry's a Hall of Famer. Yes. I think he's the only Hall of Famer outside of Adrian Peterson in the last, you know, whatever amount of years. Yeah. Well, I do also think because what's happened with the Hall of Fame voting is that you have to kind of scale down, I think, a lot of the rushing numbers and the expectations of what guys are getting, you know, because we just don't carry the ball the way we used to in this sport. And it's the opposite with the receivers. You damn, it's hard for you to figure out who is better than whom when everybody's catching 1,300 yards per season. Like, that's just insane. Uh, let's move on to uh, another edition of True Slash Lie, and we're going to focus on Derrick Henry's brand-new division, the AFC North, and let's start with his team since they did win the division, after all, more the one seed. Of course, Lamar is coming off his second NFL MVP, got the Ravens to the AFC title game for the first time ever in his tenure as a starter. But there will continue to be questions about him until he wins it all. Is that true or is it a lie, Bobby? It's a half truth. I think there will be continue to be questions about him. It depends what you're saying. Is he a great quarterback? Absolutely. Is he one of the best five in the NFL? Yeah. But when you are that player, you're judged at a different standard. And it's how you perform in the playoffs. So I think he needs to perform better in those playoff games. You, know, you can, and you don't even have to win. But you know, Josh and Josh Allen gets a little black too. But Josh Allen has performed pretty damn good in the playoffs outside of a game. You know, outside of a game versus Cincinnati, even though that they have the fa- even though they haven't gotten to a Super Bowl. I don't think anyone goes and like up oh, Josh Allen. He he doesn't play his best ball in the playoffs. With Lamar, it's been true. Like he had a good game versus the Texans. That was nice, but. For the most part, his playoff performances have been very lackluster. And I, I think that's I think he deserves the heat for that until he starts answering the bell consistently in the playoffs. Yeah, this is one of those like I say it between my teeth because I'm such a Lamar guy. Well, it's because the Lamar haters are the worst, right? They because are. they they yeah, they're the yeah. worst. So whenever you like critique Lamar and some stuff, people go like, Oh, you're you're one of them. But he does deserve critique for his playoff performances. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just r- ran into a Chiefs defense that was playing out of its mind, too. And even even he had some, like, amazing plays in that game. I still don't think the Baltimore Ravens, the line is awesome. The offensive line is awesome. Now, I have some questions about that offensive line. I, I have some questions about that Ravens roster, more questions than I know you guys have been asking. I've been trying to throw some tea leaves out there to you guys and no, none of you were fully taken about quite my questions about the O line and even like I think last year was the first year where Lamar actually had like capable people catching the ball finally like Rashad Bateman was someone healthy and I don't even think he's that good Zay Flowers is awesome and he's going to continue to be awesome and then we've talked about Odell how he's like he was a, like a disappointment last year for what he was getting paid and what he was expected to do oh and by the way Won an MVP when Mark Andrews missed like almost the entire the entire back half of the second half of the season and kicked the ass out of you know teams that were above 500 and beat them by 14 plus points. But I agree, like he needs to be better in the playoffs. But I I do have some major questions about this Ravens roster once again, not just the skill position players, but like the Ravens roster again. With the offensive line and even like de- the defensive side of the ball, they had some guys leave. They just did re-sign Kyle Van Noy today, but Jadavion Clowney mm-hmm. is out. Roquan Smith is out. I think they lost some guys in the secondary. Geno Stone being one of them. Patrick think, Queen. Uh, Pat, who did I say? Roquan Smith. Roquan Smith is there. Patrick Queen gone. My bad. Um, Geno Stone gone, and I think they lost one of their starting corners uh, as well. So they they lost a lot of pieces, and I know they're 
pretty solid at drafting, but they don't have a million draft picks. Um, and if we're talking about Lamar Jackson competing for a Super Bowl and getting them to the AFC title game, like like we're saying, that's tough to do in the AFC. That's going to be really tough. And it's going to be on Lamar Jackson to get them there. And he'll be evaluated solely with that fact of, is he going to win or not in the postseason? Yeah, I'm with you, though. I, I'm, more, I'm more worried about their defense than their offense. Yeah. Well, so getting back to the question about, is it true or is it lie that he will continue to get questions and heat? The answer is true, that he will. Yeah. Now, the question is, does he deserve it? To me, that's a lie. He does not deserve it. But this is the world we live in, and this has been going on for decades. Not Let's not act like this is a new thing. I am old enough to remember when John Elway was not a Super Bowl winner. He made it there three times in four years, all the way to the last game. He got punked by your Giants in Super Bowl XXI. He had a 10 nothing lead in Super Bowl XXII against Washington, and then they put up, I think, 35 in the second quarter, and it was over. And they never had a chance in Super Bowl 24 against Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and the San Francisco 49ers, and they got blown out 55 to 10, I believe. So everybody was saying, well, okay, he doesn't have a running game, but if you're John Elway, you got to start winning these. And then guess what? He got a freaking Hall of Fame running back in Terrell Davis and went back to back, and then it was off into the sunset, and I'll see you later. I'm going to go own some car dealerships and go run this team and get a Super Bowl eventually, and then not find a quarterback after that. I think so, a better example is Peyton because Peyton was not good in the playoffs in the beginning of his career, despite the fact that he was an MVP and great. Like, I, I think that's like the way I obviously they're very different players, but that's, that's the, the lens I look at Lamar in the playoffs is not like, up. Uh, are you really that good? No, you're really that good, but you haven't had like, you've, you've put up stinkers and lost been a big part of your team losing in the playoffs. And that was that was Peyton Manning uh, until he finally got it done and, and beat the Bears in the Super Bowl. Like they got shut out by the Jets. I mean, there were some bad playoff performances by Peyton. But wouldn't you say though that last year, even though they only put up, I believe, ten points in the AFC title game, a lot of that was predicated on the game plan offensively. They had the running backs carry the ball six times, six times. Like, yeah, I mean, Lamar did not play well. He didn't, and there were turnovers, costly turnovers. And that's been the name of the game with him in, in big games sometimes. Um, but, man, his offense didn't. His offensive play caller did not help him out. It, they they could have won that thing. Zay Flowers hangs on to that football. Oh. They could win that thing 20-17. to 17. It's real possible. Yeah, but, they. I mean, they just didn't play well on offense, even if, if they did. The, now, the, last year's game wasn't his worst, right? Like the Tennessee game in 2019. Um, right. the 2020 game versus the Buffalo, those, those games were worse. So on the scale of those, that's, that hasn't been the worst one, but it certainly wasn't good. And they were the better roster by a wide margin over the Chiefs. We, we, we would all agree, right? Yes. Uh, let's move on to the Cleveland Browns who made the playoffs while starting five different quarterbacks. If Deshaun Watson returns to his pro bowl form in Houston that he had with the Houston Texans. Cleveland is a Super Bowl contender. Is that true or a lie, Justin? I, actually, I want to cut you off. We're asking you that question. Is that true or a lie, Chris Rose, Mr. <laughs> Browns? I wanted to go last on this. I did, but I'll go well, first. I'll go first. There is an awful lot of talent on this team. Yeah. I am worried about Nick Chubb. I am worried about Nick Chubb. Now, the thing is, is that it's been so long since Deshaun Watson was Deshaun Watson at a Pro Bowl level that I forgot what he was. I really, I have to go back and see what he was as a football player because he was really good. The last year he was really good, they were 4-12. and 12. So I don't even remember what that was all about. So I, I'm going to have to go back and see what he was when they were up like 24 nothing or whatever it was in Kansas City in the divisional round. Like, I want to see what made him great again. Because it has been so long, I don't remember. But they have enough talent elsewhere. They really, they still have a lot of talent. They do. So, yeah. What's I think your confidence I'm say level yes, in Deshaun Watson? That's not high. That's not. It's I, not it, high. I will never understand... 
And maybe he maybe this year he comes back and bounces back. How he just I mean, he was awesome with the ta- like he was an like an MVP candidate. Like even remember that year they started 0 and 5, but Deshaun Watson was still like playing amazing. Um it, there there were legit lists where if you put him top 5, people wouldn't bat an eye. Not a bit. Not a bit. Now I don't know if he can get back to that. And now on top of everything else that has gone on around him, He's coming off a significant injury, now shoulder surgery. So this is another thing. I mean, it is part of the reason they brought in Jameis, I think. Yeah, famous Jameis. Was it a – was, was, and, and was it a throwing shoulder or a non-throwing shoulder? No, it's his throwing shoulder. Oh, boy. Yeah, this is, this is not pretty. So I'm going to – panic. What do, what is it? Is it true or a lie that if he does return close to the form, maybe not a Pro Bowler, but close to it? Oh, it's it's, it's true, <laughs> but I mean that's that's the huge if question, which I just don't I don't believe it, and I I didn't believe it the that even that half season that he came back after the suspension, I I that was like all right, I I think he's done because I, I'm getting to this point with quarterbacks, right? Fields, he saw years with Fields, right? Giants fans, we just did it with Daniel Jones. Where if you see years of not just like, yeah, context and situation matters, play caller matters, yeah, lack of talent matters, but if you just see years of just not good production, and I'm talking like accuracy numbers, CPOE, EPA, you know, where it's like, oh, well, look at this play. This play gives you promise. This game gives you promise here. But if it's a whole sample size of bad, it's not it's not going to be good. You're just not going to be good and you're talking to your you're talking to a wall. You're talking to yourself and you're talking to a wall if you try and convince yourself that it's just going to magically turn around because it's not. But he's it's a 28-year-old really not- player with a larger sample size of being great. That's why it's so dumbfounding what, yeah. like, what yeah, has man. happened. Yeah, man. So like- here, you want to do some trivia? We'll do some trivia of the 2023 season. Mm. EPA and CPOE composite There were 49 quarterbacks who registered at least 100 snaps at quarterback. Four of them are Cleveland Browns quarterbacks. We mentioned that there's a fifth starter, didn't register 100 snaps. The four starters that registered 100 snaps were Deshaun Watson, Joe Flacco, DTR, and P.J. Walker. We've talked about where Deshaun Watson and Joe Flacco rank in EPA and CPUE composite before. They're very close to each other. But the other two quarterbacks are very close to each other as well. There are 49 quarterbacks. Where does Deshaun Watson, Joe Flacco rank? And where does DTR and PJ Walker rank out of all quarterbacks that registered at least 100 snaps this year in EPA and CPUE composite? So there's 49, right? There's 49. So I know this because I was looking at the bottom of this list list often for Giants quarterbacks. uh, And it was always very funny. Uh, so DTR and then um, PJ Walker, they would be 48th and 49th, correct? Correct. Ding, yeah. ding, ding. I don't, I don't know where Flacco and Watson are, but I know those I'm two guys say, are dead last. I'm gonna say low 30s, like 37, 38. For 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 Flacco and Watson, they are in the low 20s, mid 20s. They're 26th and 27th. Will Levis is I right listen, below. I'm a Clevelander. I always, you know, you think worst, and yeah. then the bus is gonna hit you. Right, and Justin Fields and Ryan Tannehill are slightly above, slightly above Deshaun Watson and Joe Flacco, and then Will Levis and Gardner uh, Minshew are slightly below. Um, if it makes you feel any better, Daniel Jones was worse, Tyrod Taylor was 20th, and Tommy DeVito 44th. That's why us Giants fans were looking at that often. So, I mean, similar argument to the Jets. Hey, because let's look at the Jets quarterbacks. The Zach Wilson was 45th, Trevor Simeon 47th. Like, you're, the, the goal is to, is to get better production than that. Right next year, the goal is to get better production, even from the middle twenties. If you're in the teens, you know it's like, oh, only only imagine if you have a quarterback that's accurate and is also producing on an EPA wise. So, like, yes, if he returns to that, they are a legit Super Bowl contender. Just it's going to be a whole off season of what if, what if, what if, and I am not buying into that what if. I'm also worried about regression on that defense too. Yeah, they, they, I mean, listen, they, they are long in the tooth up front. They brought back a bunch of guys. And Schwartz Hurts, is a, this is what I run there. type of guy. So the more film you have, the the easier it is to prepare for him. Yeah. Um, let's move on to Pittsburgh. 
If the Steelers add multiple receivers in the draft, Pittsburgh will contend for the division crown. Is that true or a lie, Bobby? It's a lie. They're not even close. They, they, they'll somehow win nine, nine games, but as far as contender for the division, absolutely not. Wait, not with wait Russell Wilson and Justin they Fields as your quarterback. They won 10 games last year with bottom three quarterback play, so Russell's going to give them better than that if they don't well, add thanks, a couple they, of receivers. Thankfully, uh, Baltimore rested those starters in that in that end of the season game. Um, no, they're they're but they're not even close to any of these teams if the other teams stay healthy. So, like, to, to, hey, could they be finish ahead of the Browns and the um, the Bengals in the division? Possibly. There's no chance they're finishing ahead of the Ravens. Panic. I agree. I just think this division is too good. I think even the Bengals are are too good. Uh, the Steelers, dude, it's it's so tough because you know we we literally made the same argument for the Jets, made the same argument for the Browns. It's like, well, look at the quarterback play. The quarterback play is going to be better. So then, watch just watch what the teams do, right? But I also just don't have the same trust in. Steelers I mean, it's coaching. Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. We're not talking about a great quarterback. Play. Right, 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 right. Or the potential for a great quarterback play with Deshaun Watson. I also just don't – I don't – Mike Tomlin is a good coach in terms of getting a football team to where it needs to be to be competitive to a point. But I don't know. I, I don't know if I fully trust Mike Tomlin anymore to guide a team to a Super Bowl that doesn't have, like, the best talent – out there I don't know if I I don't know if I especially offensively and the the coaches that he's chose to lead the offense like and I can't tell you sit here and tell you that Arthur Smith is going to be a really great offensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers either yeah especially I don't know if it's a great fit with Russell and Arthur Smith but we'll see so I would call it a lie as well last thing Cincinnati Bengals Joe Burrow is coming back his lack of health is the only thing that can stop Cincinnati from making the playoffs. Is that true or a lie, Justin? It's true. It's true. If, if you look at his injury history, you know, if you Joe Burrow injury history, and you look at it, it it's it's a little daunting. It's a little daunting. I mean, you, you even remember the the right calf strain uh, that he suffered in in training camp, which really impacted the Bengals to to start the season. Uh, he had a uh, MCL sprain grade two in uh, in the in the in the in the final minutes of the Super Bowl even um, you know he had a meniscus tear in 2020 so I, obviously that's going back to his his college uh, no no his rookie year but it does 100 percent impact the Bengals and you saw Browning even have efficient play and they kind of kept themselves alive there for a couple weeks so I trust coaching roster. Bengals, and you even saw when Joe Burrow came back after that calf strain and he fully recovered from it, you saw how that Bengals offense was fully humming. If he's healthy and he's right, and I do want them to keep T. Higgins on the roster, like let's continue to make that strength the strength, they're, I think they're still the team to beat in the AFC North because I do, you know, we talked about the questions with the Ravens roster. Joe Burrow's health, if he's healthy and he's there, they're winning the AFC North. So Justin's picking the Bengals from the AFC North. Yes, I don't hate that. If I mean, if Burrow's healthy, they are like they are Super Bowl contenders. I think I think some of their young talent. I know they lost DJ Reader. That hurts a lot. Um, but I think some of their young talent could you know start to flourish a little bit on defense. You know, Miles Murphy, who they drafted in the first round. We'll see if DJ Turner and um, Daxon Hill on the defensive side can start to grow a little bit. But those are both really talented guys, and then. They're like in a good spot to add a really good piece in this in this draft in the middle of the draft. Whether they want to add more to the offensive line, despite the fact that they you know they signed Trent Brown, or they look to add a uh, you know like a weapon. Like, wouldn't you love to see Brock Bowers on the Cincinnati Bengals? I'm no. rooting for that so much. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, I yeah. If if Joe Burrow's healthy, like I agree with Joe, I, I would still pick the Ravens to win the division, but they're closer to winning the division than they are missing the playoff. I look at it from the standpoint of the Ravens have lost a lot of pieces. Yeah, they added Derrick Henry. The Ravens have lost a lot, a lot of pieces, a lot yeah. of pieces that were very productive for them in 2023 and were a very big reason why they got to where they are. The Bengals, very misfortunate to the start of the season with Joe Burrow injury. And then, of course, you end the season and then Joe Burrow gets, gets hurt. But the Bengals have also added added pieces to make them better. 
And if you add Joe Burrow back to the mix and he's healthy, that's how I look at those two rosters. Including Geno Stone. Yeah. Uh, So, right. They stole one from their division rival. Uh, Not only, I would say it's false. It's the only thing that can keep them out of the playoffs because I think it's true that it makes them a Super Bowl contender. I'm not just saying, I really believe they might be the team that scares Kansas City the most. Um, as long as Joe Burrow's around. That pains me to say that as a as a Browns fan. There is a lot of good going on in Cincinnati. Uh, I know that it's weird because they all they have now put draft capital and more importantly, a lot of money into that offensive line, and they still feel like they always need to fix it at some point uh every year. But I'll tell you where I think they could be great is the secondary. Not only bon bringing bro. in Geno Smith, who's a ball hawk, I think bringing back Von Bell is enormous to make mm-hmm. sure that all those guys are on the right page. Because last year they had too many dudes that were talented but didn't have enough time at this level. They're also going to get T- Cam Taylor Britt back. He was uh, he was playing a, almost an all pro level the first half of the year, and then he got banged up, and we just didn't see enough of him. So I think they really, really are a good team. Um, that yes, they lost DJ Reader, but they brought in Sheldon Rankins, who's solid. He's not DJ Reader, but he's a really good football player, I think. And so as long as Burrow stays upright, I can't say they'll never admit it, but I think that's the team that gives them the most pause. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Vaughn, like, I think that was like my, uh, you know, tell me one free agent signing we didn't talk about that we love was was bringing Vaughn Bell back to yeah. Lou Anarumo. Um, and then, you know, the additions of Geno Stone. Um, and it, again, they've drafted some young, really talented players who haven't put it together. You know, like I said, I've mentioned them. Um, you know, they were able to keep Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt, you know, over the years. Um, they've got a nice, you know, rotation of pass rushers. Uh, yeah, so I, I like the Bengals a lot. I'm, I'm rooting for them to get back to form this year. I know you're not Chris Rose, but I, I am rooting for yeah. that. Well, I separate my heart from what I do see out there. You know, that's what I do. That's all right, boys. All this is a fun do. hour. It flew by. Got some interesting stuff in here. And now we're getting closer and closer to giving our first mock draft as we are approaching T minus three weeks to the NFL draft, which is awesome. We love that. So for my dudes from the Talking Giants world, Bobby Skinner. Justin Pennick and our amazing producer, Mikey, as well. I am Chris Rose. We will see you next week here on Football Today.